Hi, right, everybody. Good afternoon. Mike Napoleon here with Super Speed Golf. Uh, we're going to get started with this afternoon's webinar talking about speed production um, as usual, really uh, kind of honing in here on some really cool technology to help look at the rotational sequencing elements of our golf swing. So uh, I have Joe here from KVEST. Good to see you, Joe. How you doing, Mike? Doing great. How's everything? Uh, how's every, how, where are you today? Uh, I'm in Scottsdale. Our headquarters here is in Scottsdale, Arizona. So uh, everything is good on our end over here. <clears throat> Excellent. It's a place I know well, actually, it was where I first got into the golf business was out in Arizona. So looking forward to seeing some really cool data here today um, on the rotational sequencing side. Um, kind of just the, the order of business for this afternoon, and you know, we're really glad that a few people here uh, could spend some time with us this evening. First thing we're going to do, just want to go over a little bit of information about Super Speed Golf and what we do, and how you know we've used products like K Coach over the many years now to be able to assess and analyze like a lot of the intricate detail of you know how our products are helping people get uh, more swing speed and how they're getting faster. And I think uh, Joe's got some really cool uh, live data and we're, other things we're going to look at here um, to really show you guys some of the ins and outs of what actually happens uh, to your body from a sequencing standpoint when you do some of our super speed training. So um, while we're going through this, please feel free um, to post any questions that you might have in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we'll answer a bunch of those live uh, after we go through a little bit of information here off the start. So uh, that's kind of the order of business. Now I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick and just go over a little brief overview um, of some of our super speed stuff. And then we're going to get into the, uh, the, the details about K coach. Um, you know, as usual, one of the things that, that is really important to us at super speed is looking at all of those details that affects how far a player can hit a golf ball. And, you know, we've been answering this question on, on a broad sense for many years and, you know, starting to look into a lot more detail into the inner workings of all of these different categories. We've broken it into four main categories, you know, physical, looking at that player's body, strength, force production, all the different things there that can affect physically how a player is able to swing a golf club. Mechanically, which is one that we're going to touch on a lot today, um, looking at it actually in a broad spectrum of what we call the speed pyramid, being the way that player uses the ground, how those forces and torques interact and help or hurt that player's ability to sequence their body rotationally. So we're going to look at a lot of that today with K-Coach. And then also how that rotational sequencing eventually gets out to the hands, arms, and the club and how we apply that rotational speed to the ball. So that's the speed pyramid in our mechanical model in general. Uh, we're going to really break down the middle part of that pyramid and a little bit about the top of it today. You know, we always have to look at equipment a little bit because the you know, equipment is very important to maxing out how far that ball flies. Um, you know, always something to look at that we think is really important when uh, you increase your swing speed is make sure that you're optimizing your equipment with that as well. Um, obviously, our main topic that we talk about at Super Speed a lot is how, the, how you can help players from a neurological standpoint access speed that their body is already capable of producing. And that's really what our Super Speed products are designed to do. Um, you know, really trying to get more motor units active in the body and to get those muscles responding faster to the same motor program that you're already pulling the trigger on every time you step on the tee. Um, you know, this is really about brain training, but allowing, you know, the body to respond in these faster, more efficient ways when you make a golf swing. You know, you know, our, our sets have three clubs in them. Um, one's about 20% lighter than the driver, one's about 10% lighter, and one's about 5% heavier than the driver. Going through the training with these, you know, we can see big differences in how fast a player's body is able to respond, um, you know, just from a raw club head speed standpoint. Um, I think we're also going to look at a little bit of more of the inner workings of how fast players are able to respond with these different clubs um, with K-Coach, uh, actually showing you some of the different rotational velocities that happen uh, throughout the, the golf swing. And, you know, I do think it is important to always look at the difference between when we're looking at rotational velocities and looking at linear velocity or, or actual club head speed. Um, the two definitely affect each other, but they're not exactly the same language. I think Joe's going to go over some of that with you here in a little bit. But in our normal 
you know, testing, when we just look at club head speed, we can actually see players swinging about 19% faster than their normal swing speed when we give them that green club in our set that's about 20% or about lighter than their normal driver. And that's a lot. That's, you know, like a player swinging at 100, almost going to 120. Um, and then through that training, they're going to maintain these faster speeds because of this neurological training that we're doing, maintaining even 12% faster swing speed with a club that's 5% heavier than their driver. So overspeed training in its purest sense is just making your body move faster than it normally does during something it already knows how to do in order to permanently change the expected reaction speed of your muscles. Um, now, the thing is, is that there's other stuff that we do in this training as well. You know, non-dominant training is a big piece. You know, we're going to look at some of the details of how those non-dominant swings can affect your kinematic sequence and your rotational sequencing in your dominant side swing. I think that's a really important element of a lot of what we do with our training and especially effective on rotational sequencing. Um, you know, our protocols use drills in every single session that you're going to do that are going to work on these sequencing elements of the golf swing. And I think that's just a major, major piece. So, you know, I, I think overall, that's the big picture. You know, we do have to remember that, you know, the way you use the ground definitely affects the way you sequence and the way you sequence definitely affects the way you're going to use your hands and arms to deliver the club into the ball. But all of these are connected. You know, at this point, I think I want to really hand it over to Joe so he can really blow up this uh, middle part of this pyramid and talk to us some more about the great things that uh, K Coach does with rotational sequencing. Thank you, Mike. Sure. I'm going to uh, share my screen for everybody here in one moment. Okay. Mike, let me know when you can see that on your end. Yeah, we're good to go. Okay, terrific. So uh, thanks for joining everybody. Again, I'd like to echo Mike's sentiments about joining us. Uh, I know everybody's busy, so hopefully we can provide some valuable content for you over the next uh, half hour or so. Um, again, my name is Jody Chiara. Uh, a little quick background on myself. Uh, I'm a PGA professional, been coaching for about 15 years, 10 of those years with 3D, and I'm currently head of golf here at K-Motion. Um, so look at a lot of swings in 3D over the years. Um, and have some, some good information to share with you about how we can use 3D to uh, help our players swing faster. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, today mostly. So quick background on what K-Coach is for those of you that are not familiar with our product. Uh, it's a four sensor inertial system that measures uh, your swing in three dimensions. Uh, it is a measurement and a biofeedback training software that connects uh, wirelessly via Bluetooth to those sensors. So we are going to spend most of our time today on the measurement piece. We're going to talk through some, uh, some body measurements. We're going to talk about kinematics. Um, but we also have a training uh, function that allows you to use biofeedback to get your players into better positions so that they can then transfer that energy uh, more efficiently through their body. So there's a couple things that we pay attention to when we're looking at the swing, especially from a three-dimensional aspect, uh, and what those main factors are that goes into producing club head speed. And as Mike just said from his presentation, there's a number of factors that go into this, and there's no you know, standard bucket that you can place a player in. Um, everybody's different, and everybody's different when we talk about really what's helping them produce speed or what's uh, hindering them from producing speed. But for today's purposes, we're going to talk about what we call sequencing and what sequencing that we pay attention to when we're looking at the golf swing in 3D. We're also going to talk about timing, right? So not only do we have to have the uh, golf swing working in the right order, which is the sequence, we have to have things happening at the right time because there's a finite amount of time that a golf swing exists. So if we don't get the job done by the time the player gets the club head to the ball, then a lot of what we might be doing might not produce end results that we desire to have. Uh, and then the third one is what we call body speed or rotational velocities. Uh, rotational velocities certainly are a major component to being able to get that energy from the ground, through your body, and out into the club. Without this, it's going to be really hard to produce 
higher club head speed. So that's, that's a third piece that we're gonna talk about today. So to get things started, we're gonna talk about sequence first. And when we're looking at the kinematic sequence, which is what you're seeing here, this graph, it's measuring the rotational velocities of the four segments that we measure with K-Coach. So the red line indicates the pelvis, the green line is indicative of the torso speed. The blue line is going to measure the lead upper arm in this case. And then the brown line is going to measure the hand or really the handle of the golf club. So when we look at sequences, we really can break it down into three different types of sequences. The takeaway, the transition, and the peak speed sequence. So the takeaway, if you look at the far left-hand side of this graph here, I've got them shaded in blue for all of you. So the takeaway is really just paying attention to the order that each segment starts its rotational velocity from the setup position. So when a golfer sets up to the golf ball, what's moving first, okay? It's not measuring how fast yet, we're just measuring what initiates the takeaway, okay? Then in the transition, which is our number two shaded area there, if we move over to the right, it's measuring how each segment is changing directions from backswing into downswing, okay? So the order of events, right? We're not measuring anything else when we talk about sequence, just order of events of changing directions. And then finally, the third is the peak speed sequence, which you see all the way over on the large shaded area there on the right-hand side, which is measuring what order each segment reached its maximum rotational velocity and starts to decelerate, right? We know that acceleration as well as deceleration is a huge key in transferring energy through the chain of the body and out into the club. So that's what the peak speed sequence helps us identify. We then have timings, okay? So once we get past the order of events, now we're talking about when things are happening. So we also have three timings that we pay attention to in the golf swing. Takeaway timing, transition timing, and impact timing. So if we just look at how the segments have moved away, now I'm paying attention to what's happening at a certain point in time in the swing or by that point in time in the swing. So some of the important timings that we pay attention to in the takeaway, so at frame 50, okay, so we measure at 200 frames per second just for everybody as a reference. So what I look for is a good takeaway, what we call stretch by frame 50, meaning once that frame 50 hits, we should see a separation between the torso and the pelvis. So that I've started the torso on a more quiet or less rotated pelvis, okay? That's really important because that's gonna allow us to start to create some stretch, which will help us create more speed. Then if we look at the transition timing, the important aspect to note is that we want all of those segments to have transitioned before the top of the swing. Top of the swing in K-Coach is when the hand sensor changes directions from going back into the backswing and starts the downswing. So we, as a timing aspect, we want the pelvis, the torso, and the arm to have all transitioned before that time, all right? And ideally, we'd also like to see equal spacing between all three segments, meaning that you're transitioning not only in order, but at the right time to then be able to start to create acceleration rates in the downswing. Finally, impact timing. We know that we looked at peak speed sequence. Now if we talk about peak speed timing, we want to see those segments peak at specific times in the downswing so that it gives enough time for the club 
to build as much speed as it can before it gets to impact. So just by rule of thumb, what we look for is if you take the pelvis and you look at where it peaks in the downswing, we want to see it peak essentially right in the middle of the downswing or splitting the goalpost between the top of the swing and impact. And then if we start going to the torso, we want to see the torso peak after the pelvis, or, uh, but again, before impact, right? So if we take the pelvis then and take that peak and then take impact, ideally the torso should peak between those two points in time. And then the arm should peak between the torso and impact. And then finally the hand is gonna peak just before impact, allowing the club to then release and gain as much speed as it possibly can before it strikes the ball. So as we talk about those peak speeds, what's important to know is those peak speeds are created by the combination of acceleration of a segment and then the deceleration of a segment. So we, a lot of the times we'll refer to this as ski slopes. So going up the ski slope is what I refer to as hitting the gas or getting that segment to accelerate. And then going down the ski slope, we want to put the brakes on so that the energy can then transfer to the next segment in line. Okay, so it kind of is a ever building set of mountaintops like you see in this visual here, if done correctly. And then the end result is that the club would have gained its most amount of potential speed, right, with the least amount of energy expended by the athlete a lot of the times. You'll see a lot of athletes overwork to get speed when in reality they could do it a lot more efficiently. So a couple examples here of why is this graph efficient? So if we look at the uh, takeaway sequence, we can see that the red line and the green line or the pelvis and the torso have separated by frame 50. So we have a good start to the swing to create some stretch. Then we look at the transition sequence and we can see that each line is crossed before the top and are of equal space, right? So we have a good transition sequence and good transition timing. And then we can see that the peak speeds are in order. There might be a little bit uh, improvement that could be made on the timing, but they are in order, which is a huge piece to transferring that energy. And then we can also see that the slopes, right, those mountain slopes of acceleration and deceleration match, right? At least as soon as they start to decelerate, we can see a similar slope from the building up to the mountaintop and then coming down the backside of that slope. So this is a good example of an efficient kinematic sequence. And then one that might not be as efficient and we can do some work in is if we go back to that takeaway, we can see the red line and the green line don't really separate until frame about 70. So it's a little bit late. So that would be the equivalent of me starting my backswing with both my pelvis and my torso rotating at the same rate of speed, kind of like a log, right? Which a lot of the times will get the club to work too far inside under the plane and we know that can cause more issues down the road and really rob players of a lot of speed later on in their swing. We can also see that not all three lines cross before the top of the swing. So we have an issue with transition sequence as well as transition timing. We can see that the peak speeds are also out of order, right? So this player is going to definitely overwork for any speed that they get in this swing because they're not taking advantage of transferring energy through the chain of their body as well as they can. And we can see as a result, their acceleration rates and deceleration rates are compromised as a result because of all the other areas that we just mentioned. So again, it's like a domino effect, right? Starting from the takeaway, working our way through the swing, how well are those dominoes set up so that I can just knock the first one over and I'll let, let a lot of them go in succession. So a couple more things that really you can see in this technology that play a huge role 
in being able to know how well your player is generating speed or what their ceiling is. And again, I'd like to, to mention that a lot of what we're going over right now is simply impossible to see with video, right? We're talking about three-dimensional movements and we're talking about frames of time that are down to the millisecond. So it's really impossible to see them on video, but they really do show up plain as day when we're looking at them in 3D. So this is called your X-factor graph. Uh, we call it K-factor in our uh, K-code software. And it's really a secret weapon to maximizing your player's output of speed. So it measures the real-time difference of rotation between my pelvis and my torso throughout the entire golf swing. So a couple things that I pay attention to as a coach when I'm trying to get my player to generate as much power as possible. The first one is I want to see a rapid decline in the takeaway, meaning my torso is rotating faster than my pelvis, and we're creating a lot of separation between the two. Then I want to see it increase by about five to seven degrees or thereabouts after the top of the swing. So as I get to the top of my swing, to increase the separation, I'll have to stabilize my torso and start with my pelvis. That's showing me that I have a good transition sequence and I've got a good start to some pelvic acceleration in the downswing early. But then the key, really the big key is, we want the torso to almost, but not quite catch the pelvis by the time it gets to impact. So you can see that it crosses negative, but it only crosses negative by about 10 degrees, meaning when I got to impact, my pelvis was 10 degrees more open than my torso. Where you'll see a lot of players struggle, especially juniors, because they lack some strength, is they'll create a ton of stretch, get the pelvis way out ahead, torso will lag way behind, and you'll see that line cross negative 20 to negative 30. So what they've done is they've created a lot of potential energy and never got the ability to get it out into the golf club, right? So that's a huge piece that you want to pay attention to because creating stretch is only as good as the amount that you can close on by the time you get to impact or else it's wasted, right? So that's where the super speed sticks and the protocols are huge because they really train your body to move faster so you can close that stretch and take full advantage of what you're creating in your swing. Finally, we look at the wrists, right? This is the top of that pyramid, as Mike suggested with the lag. So lag, if we can define it for today's purposes, is gonna be the hinging and unhinging of my lead wrist. Okay, and that's indicative of the blue line in this graph. We call that deviation, ulnar deviation, downward, radial deviation as my thumb works back to my forearm. So good wrist mechanics when we're talking about deviation could either be a megaphone for your speed production or a muzzle, right? It could do tons for it positively or it could just kill it all together. So sequence, plays a huge part in being able to create lag properly, right? So don't discredit all the things we talked about with the sequence and the timing, because all of that plays a huge part in how the wrist mechanics work in the swing. But just for some generalities, when a player is set up at a dress, we usually will see some ulnar deviation or unhinging of the wrist, right around 20 to 30 degrees as an average. The key that you want to see is that it goes negative by the time they get to its max point in the downswing, right, as they're working their way back. Some people will get to more negative on the way back and then maintain it on the way down and then get rid of it late, or some will kind of keep less um, hinge and then create it on the way down. This player does a little bit of both, which is okay, as long as they're able to let go of it or create that ulnar deviation 
of about the same amount that they had at address by the time they get to impact. So you want to see about the same, if not a little bit more, which will allow you to understand and see that your player is not only creating that lag, but then getting rid of it by the time they get to impact, which will then boost up that club head speed. And again, the, the sticks are a great way to train that with your player. So again, uh, that's just the kinematics and just some, some quick tips uh, for everybody to pay attention to if you're training speed. Um, Mike, did you want to add anything else before we talked about that special offer that we wanted to offer everyone? Um, yeah, no, I think that was a lot of great information there, Joe. I, I think one of the big pieces to remember, you know, especially for all the, especially recreational golfers out there, is that, you know, a lot of this data is not stuff that you may need to be able to analyze yourself, but it's really about being able to find out the pieces and where there are inefficiencies in your golf swing in order to very easily um, be able to correct those. And one of the things that we've really tried to do with our super speed protocols is the drills that are involved in our protocols, like our, um, you know, like, like our step change of direction drill or like our heel stomp drill, or even when you get into the more advanced drills, like double step and some of those that we have in our later protocols, these are all designed specifically to help improve a lot of the efficiency of the sequencing elements that Joe was talking about. You know, one of the easiest things I've ever done as a golf coach to help somebody understand how to get their body transitioning in a better order is to actually make them do like that step change of direction motion and step through the swing. It forces the lower body to initiate the downswing, which is a really, really good thing. Um, you know, and then as you start to look at some of the more advanced details and we start to look at like how we do the non-dominant swings are really to help in many ways with, you know, muscle activation and motor control on your non-dominant side, which becomes the lead side of your golf swing. And that can have a huge impact on making those little ski slope peaks more efficient as well in the kinematic sequence. So, you know, I just think there's a lot of that, that, you know, really cool stuff about how we use these systems to be able to understand you know, what we're doing right now, is it efficient? Is it working well? And then where's the practical elements about how to actually start to really look at that and fix it if you've got inefficiencies? Absolutely. Makes total sense. Great. Mike, um, I don't know if we have any questions, but I'll just uh, tell everybody about that special offer that we did want to offer them. Go for it. So for everybody on here, just as a thank you, so if you do decide that you would like to get a K-Coach, um, you can reach out to me at jvchiera at k-vest.com. With the purchase of any K-Coach, we're going to give you a free set of speed sticks of your choice so that you can kind of put everything we talked about into practice, train with those protocols, being able to measure them with your players, and really get your players uh, swinging faster or get yourself swinging faster if you're a golfer. So, do we have any questions over there, Mike? For we'll probably uh, have some questions coming in, you want to go ahead and turn your screen share off, and we'll uh, sure. we'll answer some questions. Did you have um? Did you have some of the um, data points we wanted to look at on there as well? For myself. Yep. Which data points are you speaking about? Uh, it's all good. Never mind. It's just something I, I might have heard from our conversation yesterday. Uh, Kyle, uh, Mike, what questions do we have to start? Yeah, for sure. So uh, just as a friendly reminder, if anybody does have any questions, to please type them in the Q&A panel. Uh, the first question will be for you, Mike. Um, yep. For everybody listening, I know a lot of people have been interested in uh, Bryson DeChambeau and what he's been doing specifically, all the work uh, through upper speed training as well as you know physical fitness. What can we learn from what he has done, Mike, and how he's added over speed training as part of his regimen? I mean, I think we can definitely learn that if somebody wants to increase their swing speed and their distance on how far they can hit the ball, there are a number of different things that are involved with doing that and putting them all together at once, like Bryson has done, certainly can have a huge benefit in, uh, in, in distance. You know, I think for most people out there, again, underlying 
you know, looking at, at most amateur golfers, I think it's incredibly important to look at a lot of those underlying physical elements that may be kind of roadblocks or standing in the way of you maxing out your gains and swing speed. And then, you know, so that's a part to assess. I think looking at the mechanical elements or looking at the efficiency of the sequencing and how all that's working, like on a system like K Coach, is incredibly important to knowing where, you're, where you start. Looking at your equipment is also another one that's very important. I mean, you can be losing 15, 20 yards off the D just because you're hitting the wrong driver, and that doesn't make any sense. And then adding in those neurological uh, overspeed training elements or a way to you know, potentially start to round out that entire program uh, if you're really looking for optimal ways to increase your distance. And you know, I don't know from personal experience, I don't know, you know, I haven't talked with all of his coaches, but I imagine that Bryson has done all of those different factors um, concurrently to, to really get the huge gains that you're seeing with him out on tour this year. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next question is for Joe. Joe, if you could talk about some of the considerations um, for senior golfers, uh, you know, some of the things that you might see in terms of their kinematic sequence and uh, any helpful uh, tips that you might uh, offer. Absolutely. Great question. So what I would say for a lot of the senior golfers um, that are trying to hit it further, obviously, I revert back to, to Mike's point on equipment, right? You, I can't stress that enough. Get the right equipment in your hand um, to maximize what you are doing. So when I do coach senior golfers, um, one of the things I'll pay more attention to is even though there might be slower speeds uh, overall in terms of what they're maxing out as, what I will pay more attention to is the, what we call the peak speed gains, right? So how much more is each segment building on top of one another? And there's a number of reasons why that could happen. It could be technical, you know, better, better positions in your swing, could be better equipment, uh, it could be better use of the ground, right? So you would want to pay less attention to the overall speeds because it might just simply be out of the equation to get to these higher speeds, but you can definitely max out what you have by understanding about the sequencing and then building on those speed gains so that you can maximize the, the speed that you do have. And that's kind of what I would urge a lot of the senior golfers to pay attention to where, you know, just by improving your transition sequence alone could definitely improve your speed gains and help you hit it further without really moving your body that much faster. Perfect. Uh, and then kind of building upon that point, Joe, could you explain the difference between the K uh, player system and like the K coach system fully? So the, the differences between the two models and, and what is most uh, practical for uh, each model? Great. Yep. So we have two types of technology. We have a K coach, which I showed you in that uh, second slide. Really, that's our system that measures and allows you to train. Um, so you can capture swings with K-Coach. You can see all the graphs, all the reports, and do the biofeedback training. And that's four sensors that are needed for that. K-Player is just two sensors. It's the torso and the pelvis. And it doesn't allow you to capture any swings or measure, but it will allow you to train positions in biofeedback and allow you to do biofeedback training. Um, we've had, you know, obviously a lot of coaches will buy K-Coach, but we've also had a lot of home users buy K-Coach that want all that information. Maybe they're working with a coach or they're kind of doing it on their own. Some will, you know, contact me for some consultation, but a lot of the times they want that information and then they can go to do that training as well. So to boil it down, K-Coach is four sensors, gives you all the measurement and training K player just allows you to train without any of the measurement. Perfect. Uh, next question is for Mike from Steve. Uh, he's been training with uh, our super speed set over the past couple of weeks, Mike. He's currently stuck at 102. Any suggestions for him? Okay, so 102 club speed. Um, and I'd also ask where, where did you start? 
so Steve hasn't provided that information quite yet, but anything that you could uh, provide in terms of, you know, somebody particularly starting at level one? Um, yeah, so I mean, in general, uh, what you're going to see on a club speed gain standpoint, you should see on, well, on average, we see about a 5% gain. Um, if you measured before and after club speed, um, you know, really even on the very first session. So like if you started at, let's say it's 96, 97 miles an hour, it's very likely that even after that first session of doing overspeed training, you'd see the speed jump to about 100 to 102. Um, now, it's not a linear progression, though. So like what's going to happen is after that first session, if your starting speed was 96, you're going to come back the next day and it's going to be pretty much back to 96. You do the training again, it'll go back up to 101, 102. It takes regular practice, so about three days a week with a day off in between, between over, the, over six to eight weeks to make your new normal or to really change that, that permanent gain in speed up to that 101, 102 range, and then you'll enter a plateau phase. Sometimes people will get there a little faster. So we say six to eight weeks is normal. Certainly seen people get into that first plateau in four to six weeks, seen others that it's taken nine to 10. So, but on average about, uh, six to eight weeks of time, uh, and you'll get that that 5% speed gain permanent. But don't expect it to be a just constant linear progression of speed gain. It's more like a jump, and then it'll take a little while for it to normalize, and then you'll enter a plateau for a while where the before and afters are going to be the same. Um, and then when you continue working over time, you'll get secondary jumps and then another normalization and another um, plateau. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Uh, next question is for Joe. Uh, we have a, a attendee that is working with a collegiate male player who spins his hips out and can't seem to get his arms or hands in front of him. Sounds like it could be an efficient kinematic sequence. Could you talk a little bit more about what is efficient and uh, why this player might be having this specific issue? Yeah, so this is a, a common issue. It can be a common issue all the way up to that collegiate level. I placed them in that bucket of juniors. Um, you know, uh, collegiate females, a lot of the time that lack a little bit on the strength side, you'll see this. Um, so just as a generality, and again, I hate to put it into general terms, because this is very specific from player to player. But all I'll tell you is, I would take a look at how much separation they're creating in the backswing, how much more they're creating in transition, and then try and see how much separation they have at impact, right? You don't really want any more than 15 degrees of separation at impact. So what you might want to do, depending upon your philosophy or your approach, is you might want to limit how much separation they, they had on the way back. So when they create more, they're not as far apart, and it's easier for them to close it or you might want to limit how much they're getting the pelvis out ahead in that transition phase and maybe train them to kind of speed the torso up a little bit faster to not get the gap as big, right? I'm not sure which one would work for the player, but at the end of the day, if they spin their hips and they're too big of a separation and impact, they're going to have a significant uh, power leap when, when that happens. Yeah, if I could add just a little bit on that too. Um, I, I think this is a very common problem that you see from, as a coach, you know, definitely with your kind of advancing high school players and collegiate players. So this goes back to junior development, right? So kids are going to get strong in their legs well before they get strong in their core and their upper bodies. So there's two things that could be going on here and they're easily testable. So the first one is going to just be a, a straight power standpoint. You need to you need to basically test that player to see if their, their physical power generation is kind of lopsided. So a lot of these players, their power generation might be much more based on their lower body and legs and their core and upper body is not going to be nearly as powerful from a physical standpoint. Correction there is going to be getting that player in the gym working on speed and power development for their upper body. So that's kind of number one. The other one is it could just be a motor program standpoint where because they're they developed with a stronger lower body they started to develop this pattern that their lower body was moving faster and that was just the way they got used to swinging 
that's kind of a different situation. So if their body is pretty balanced from a speed and power generation standpoint, that player would be one where drills that are much more based on upper body speed would be very effective for that player. So you, you kind of need to, first of all, the other thing I would say is you never want to tell that player to slow their hips down. So I think that's the wrong way to go. Never tell that player to slow down where their main power source is coming from right now. You want to figure out a way to make the others match up in a, in a more efficient way, um, you know, either through that, that greater strength and power development or through drills that are going to really work on that. Um, so I think those would be some really good ones to, to put in there. Um, actually, we've seen some success with that with our uh, Super Speed C training club. So our counterweight training club is one that is definitely a benefit for that player that needs to get the upper body moving faster relative to the lower body. That, that seems to be uh, one of the major mechanical effects of that training product. Thanks both. Um, this is a question for both Joe and Mike. Uh, to build on the Bryson comment, a lot of people have seen that he's increased the speed of his backswing. Can you both comment on why he might be doing that, the effects of that on maybe a timing and sequencing side as well as a physical side? Go for it, Joe. Go, go for it. Take it away first, Mike, or you want me to go? Go ahead. So, yeah, this is uh, kind of a hot topic today. I've seen some comments on certain threads about this of, uh, revolving around the stretch shorten cycle and you know a faster backswing being able to allow Bryson to create more force early on in the downswing and then put more overall energy into his swing. Um, I've seen kind of uh, a little bit of debating going back and forth. Um, I personally have not done any testing on it. Mike, I, I don't know if you guys have or not, but certainly speak to that, but um, I think the faster backswing and the force that that would create going in the opposite direction of the downswing can allow for a little bit more overall force into the swing when Bryson does change directions. So he's probably using that as a little bit of an amplifier to the speed that he's creating in the downswing. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll hit this on two topics. First of all, physically, muscles do not work like rubber bands. So the faster you load a muscle, the faster it will unload. And the faster something unloads or loads, the more force is evolved in that process. Because if you think about force is mass times acceleration, right? Think of acceleration as velocity squared. So basically the faster something's moving at an exponential rate is gonna create more force. All right, so there is definitely scientific physics proof that if you make the backswing move faster, you can potentially make the downswing move faster. Now, that being said, it's not always the right answer for a player to do that because from a motor programming standpoint and a learned skill standpoint, if you've ingrained the skill of a certain, um, I would say cadence of your golf swing that involves a certain speed of a backswing and downswing, Changing that can mess up the sequencing and the timing of the transition of your swing and all of that in a major way. So it, it's not always necessarily the right answer that immediately everyone should go out and speed up their backswing in order to increase swing speed. However, if done the right way, from a raw physics standpoint, increasing the speed of your backswing can give you more potential for downswing speed for sure. Yeah, and I, I'd add to that, Mike, um, I don't know about what you have seen, but I think changing a player's tempo is probably one of the hardest things to do and get them to feel comfortable with. I think it depends on the player. I think it depends on how, uh, how comfortable that player is. I think sometimes if you're making big changes in a player's swing, changing the tempo can be very effective because it at least triggers these new motor programs that you're trying to uh, ingrain in that player. So I think it can go both ways. It really just depends on the individual circumstance. But yeah, baseline there is faster backswing will produce a faster downswing. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, I have an interesting question here for you, Mike, from Jason. Jason says, I've been working uh, with super speed for quite some time. And when I've done the half swing test uh, during the advanced speed uh, development protocols, I match, uh, even sometimes beat my full swing speed. What does this tend to indicate? 
Well, I would say that tends to indicate that from a sequencing and efficiency standpoint, rotationally, that you're doing a pretty good job. So just to make sure that people understand what he's talking about. So our, we have a protocol on our website called our Advanced Speed Development 2 Rebound Protocol. This is a protocol specifically designed to improve a player's kinematic sequence. And even to get in more specific on that, to really increase the deceleration chain. So the steepness of those peaks in the deceleration chain, um, trying to get a bigger uh, speed jump in between those different segments. And that rebound protocol really looks like a, a protocol where you actually make a swing in one direction and then immediately swing back the other way. So if you think about what that's doing, you know, if I wanted to exaggerate stabilizing a segment or causing a segment to decelerate and transferring rotational speed up the chain, the biggest exaggeration I could get of that would not to just slow it down, but actually make it accelerate in the other direction. So that's really the idea of the rebound protocol. <laughs> so to do that rebound protocol, we have a pretest for it, um, which is something we call our half, ha half swing speed test. So what that is, is that's you take a full swing, all right? And let's say that your full swing speed with a six iron is 80 miles an hour. If a player is using rotational sequencing efficiently, we will generally see that that player <clears throat> can get within 7% uh, of the same swing speed with taking a half swing, basically like arm parallel type motion swing and, and taking a swing from there. You can get within 7% of the same. Um, ball speed, you can get within about 10% of the same. Now, this is not nearly as, this is one of those tests that um, can definitely give us false negatives. So there will be time to time that you can make this happen and there's still things that can improve in your sequencing, but all it's gonna do is give you a couple more drills. So it's not a big deal. Um, but if, if what we find with players that have very poor uh, efficiency, poor sequences, is that you're not going to see yourself anywhere close. You're going to take that half swing and your club speed is going to go down by half. And that means that we're generally not using rotational sequencing very efficiently. Um, obviously, the better way to measure this is with something like K-Coach to be able to really look at the details of that being efficient. But yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're getting about the same club speed from a half speed, half swing position as you are from a full swing position, I would say you're definitely sequencing rotationally very well. I'd also kind of question if you're using the ground as effectively as you could, or if you know your hand and arm delivery to the ball uh, could be a little more efficient because I should see that about 7% gain uh, when you get back to your full swing from the half swing. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Uh, the next question is going to be for both of you. Uh, Gary is an eight handicap, and uh, he has a tendency to spin out from his shoulders early, making it hard to shallow the club, causing an inefficient kinematic sequence. Do you guys have any uh, suggestions for why this might be happening and any corrections that he could put in place? Uh you know, the reasons why that could be happening could go from physical to motor pattern, right? Um, so it's hard to say why it's happening, but I'll tell you in that regard where you kind of get the shoulders going before the pelvis, getting steep early in the downswing, which, you know, causes some issues in terms of those rotational velocities later. Um, uh, what Mike mentioned, the step change of direction drill is one of my favorites for that to get the pelvis going earlier. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I think that's a really good one to look at. I mean, it really depends. Like there could be, um, you know, physically, there could be motor control issues between, you know, just physically your ability to control your lower body or pelvis independently of the upper body. We see a lot of players that can't really disassociate or separate those segments very well in their golf swing. Um, that tends to be the number one cause of, um, you know, over the top swing path, fast upper body, fast arms, fast hands is just from a plain motor control standpoint, you're not able to control your lower body well. I think the other one that's very big there would go into some of our, our you know, ground forces talk, um, not really pressing on the ground efficiently in the right way throughout the swing um, can make it very difficult. Essentially, you can be creating forces that are working against your lower body um, from rotating. And if you're working against your lower body from rotating, your body's going to go to the next easiest thing, which is going to be the hands and arms going. 
So I think those are kind of the two most common things that we would see is, is causing that problem. Great. And to follow that up, Gary had a follow-up question to that. You know, what area uh, would you recommend tackling first and how would you measure it? Obviously, K-Motion would be great. I know we've worked with Swing Catalyst before. Any recommendations just kind of help round this out for Gary, who's obviously looking for some help identifying yeah, this? I'm always a fan of, fan of ground up. Um, I think that's, that's kind of good. I would make sure that, you know, just and we, you can actually watch our webinar that we have on our website that we did with Swing Catalyst. It can show you some of the real details about um, how like backswing ground reaction forces and transition ground, ground reaction forces can either promote or inhibit proper sequencing of the lower body. So I think that's a big one. Um, the other one that I would do right away though is go stand in front of a mirror, um, hold your upper body as still as you can and try to rotate your hips back and forth and if you can do that easily, then the physical one might not be the issue. But if you get there and you're having a really hard time motor control wise, trying to rotate your lower body and upper body independently, um, you may want to start there. Yeah, I'd agree with Mike on that. I'd go through that process of elimination. Definitely try that pelvis rotation test first just to see if it's, you know, a motor pattern thing. But the good news is, it, even if you can't do that, um, just by doing it, periodically can help improve that, right? So you're just trying to strengthen those connections between the brain and that part of your body to tell it what to do. Because that's something that, you know, quite honestly, we don't really ever do in anything else in our lives, right? So, you know, sometimes those connections become weak. Um, it's not that you're physically limited. It's just a motor pattern thing, right? So you can go through, you know, a couple mornings and just do it as a little wake up routine. And you'll be surprised how it can quickly improve. Perfect. We're all set. Any closing thoughts? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to really thank Joe for coming on with us today. You know, it's really fun to, you know, kind of hear all the cool stuff and latest things about, uh, you know, great analysis technology. You know, even if it's not something that, you know, you're interested in purchasing yourself, finding a uh, certified professional in your area that's using systems like K-Coach, uh, it's such an advantage when you, uh, when, you, when you get in and you can really pinpoint you know, the areas you should be working on in your golf swing. I, I can't recommend highly enough finding coaches that are using this uh, uh, software out there. Yeah, and I'd like to thank you guys for hosting. I really appreciate it. It's been great coming on and talking a little bit about 3D and how we can get our players to swing faster. And if anybody has any follow-up, you know, questions that pop into their mind, you know, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer anything, um, you know, in the coming days or weeks. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody, everybody uh, you know, stay safe out there and have a really great evening. Um, hope everybody's getting out to play in some golf and uh, bombing it down the fairway. We'll see you guys next time. Uh, just stay tuned on social media to see our next webinar coming soon. Thank you.